is part three of our interview with former Blue Oyster Cult drummer Albert Bouchard. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Music. And the other, one of the other things that I would say, because this is a regret, I have a regret. And that is that uh, one night, uh, we, you know, I had this band Soft Right Underbelly. It was like the predecessor to uh, Blue Oyster Cult, but, you know, Joe wasn't in it. Joe was still going to college then. So uh, we got a gig as the house band at uh, a club called Steve Paul Scene. It was like basically an after hours club on 45th Street in Manhattan, west side of Manhattan. And I, I think it was, uh, run, it was, it, it wasn't really run, it wasn't owned by the mob, but the mob was, you know, they were pushing in on it and, you know, offering protection and all this stuff to poor Steve Paul. So, uh, you know, and eventually they had to close because of, because of that whole thing. But, but he hired us as the house band. So we warm up for all the various acts that would come in there, the national acts. And one night after we played our set, Jimi Hendrix came in. And right after, and he came in with his entourage, he went all the way to the other side of the, the room. And then right after that, Ringo came in with a couple people. And he sat at the opposite side. And so uh, the Teddy Slatis, the house manager, came up and he said, uh, hey, Albert, um, Jimmy, Jimmy wants to uh, sit in and, uh, and we want to know if Ringo can use your kit. I said, are you kidding? Yeah, of course he can. And so he said, well, go over and tell him it's okay to use his, your kit. So I went over to Ringo. I said, "Hey, Ringo, pleasure to meet you. You know, he, you know, he knew I was the drummer, and he because he saw me play. And uh, I said, uh, "Listen, uh, Jimmy is going to play, and uh, if you want to use my drum kit, you know, that'd be great. You know, I'd be honored for you to play it." And he's like, "Oh no, no, I, I you know, I'm just going to be a spectator tonight. I've had a busy week, you know." You know, so and it turned out that he was at a, a party with Hendrix the night before at Stephen Stills' house in L.A. So they had flown to New York, probably half in the bag, yeah. and so he didn't want to play. So I thought maybe I should ask Jimmy if I could play. Yeah, and i I didn't have the I didn't have the nerve to do it. You know, and I thought, oh, that'd be obnoxious. And then I didn't realize that, you know, he was looking for a drummer. You know, he was looking for somebody because, you know, he couldn't, you know, he ended up getting uh, Buddy Miles. But, you know, it could have been me on, on Bands of Gypsies, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I wish I was, I, I wish number one. I would be cool with the people that I like, but number two, that I could have been a little more forward as far as advancing my career. I think that that's something that, uh, you know, I, and I regret that. I mean, it probably wouldn't have changed anything, you know, but at least I could have asked, you know, you don't ask, you don't get. <laughs> but how old would you have been then? I was, uh, let's see, that was uh, 68, so I was 21. Yeah, just turn uh, still just young. 21 yeah yeah that's the thing about that i most of the things i regret are in that pocket between i mean as a young adult or the pocket between 19 and 26 after that i'm going oh you know i just going through the history of that blue oyster cut occult album that you know you spearheaded and all that i'm reading it yeah you know, i'm kind of reading it i'm learning things some of the stuff i already knew but i'm going this never ends this is like one of the longest pages of any Blue Oyster Cult album, you know, and, and, and then the praise that it received, of course, from Rolling Stone. But I'm reading this and I'm going, there's such a, and, and, and I find it interesting that it's come to fruition again through your own terms, right? Yeah. And I'm yeah. listening to the old, al the, the old song and a newer version, and I'm going, I, I really like, I really like what you've done. I oh, mean, thanks. Thanks. There's, 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 you know how it is, you're driving through a town sometimes and you don't know why, one part of the town just feels better. Like, there's no reason for it. It just, you just feel good when you're driving there. And I'm going, when I'm driving to this 
project, I feel good as opposed, and I like the, the original, I like the, the Blue Easter Cult one too, but I, I'm driving, I'm going, there's just life, there's just, I, it wakes me up inside, jiggles me as they say, you know? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, well, the, you know, the whole thing was that I didn't actually finish the story. So I, I spent that time with Sandy Perlman. And one of the things that happened was, you know, I sang him the song Independence. It's the song that Joe, it's going to be the next single. I don't know if you've heard it yet, but but Joe sings it. And uh, he wrote, he helped me finish it. But uh, I, I sang it to him and I said, Sandy, I'm going to redo Imaginos and I'm going to do bombs over Germany, and I'm going to do the Mutant Reformation. I'm going to do all three records. I promise you this, you know, so please get better. <laughs> I thought I could bribe him, but nah, he was, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was uphill battle for him. He lost too many brain cells and, you know, it was, uh, but he hung on, he hung on for six months after that. So, yeah. Yeah. You, know, you know, the day he died, I was on, I was actually playing in London with Blue Oyster Cult.